Good evening. Welcome to the Library Auditorium here at Isothermo Community College. This is kind of like a homecoming for me tonight. It is great to be back on campus. Uh, after retirement almost two years ago, I invested 30 years of my life uh, serving proudly on the faculty here at the college, uh, serving as an instructor in the radio and TV broadcasting program, which is located in the Communications Technology Building just up the hill, uh, also home of Western North Carolina's window to a world of great music, WNCW. My name is Jay Coombs. I was absolutely flattered. Uh, a couple of months ago, Kathy Webb from the library contacted me and initially, when I picked up the phone, you have to remember, most of the conversations I have had with Kathy over the past 15, 20 years, Jay, my microphone is not working in the library auditorium. Jay, I have a music program. Can you bring me four additional microphones? And so when Kathy called me and she said, I need to ask you something. And I said, well, Kathy, if you have a problem with the microphones, I said, Jim Leverett is still up the hill. You need to call Jim and he'll tell No, no, no. Then she told me about this program, the kickoff for the series called History Matters. And when she started telling me what she had planned for tonight, I got excited. I said, this sounds like a great program. And I think tonight, hopefully by the time it is over, you will agree with me, a very interesting, informative, entertaining, and just a fun evening. Tonight's presentation is called Famous Faces in Local Places. And most of our presenters tonight, many of us very familiar with. There may be one or two you've never heard of before. And that's what makes tonight special. First of all, throughout the evening, some very special thank yous. Two days ago on Tuesday, I walked in the front door of the library to meet with Kathy, and immediately when I opened the door, it was like, uh -uh. the air conditioning in this building failed on Monday. It was hot. It was stuffy. And Kathy and I both looked at each other and we said, please, 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 before Thursday night, we get the air back. Well, big thanks have to go to Bill Dahl, also to Lewis Walker, Isothermal Community College Maintenance Department. They got right to work. And as you can tell tonight, the air conditioning is working. So we appreciate all of their help. Tonight's program is brought to you by the staff of the library here at Isothermal Community College. In fact, let me take just a minute. In the back of your program, and these programs very, very well done tonight, have to give a shout out to our print shop as well. But I'd like to take it just a minute to recognize the library staff here at the college. The director of the library is Charles Wiggins. Acquisition technician is Donna Kane. Library clerk, and she is working at her desk right now, Penny Brown. And library specialist, Kathy Webb, instrumental in putting this program together tonight. Thank you to the members of the library staff. Later, I will recognize the planning committee for tonight's program. First of all, though, a fun fact about the Isothermal Community College Library. When Kathy first showed me this, I kind of laughed. And I said, Kathy, are you sure? And she goes, oh yeah, I'm sure. Did you know that the Isothermal Community College Library is open to the public? 
I thought everybody knew. Yes, it is certainly open to the public. Students, staff, faculty here at the college, but the library also serves our community. And we invite you to stop by, visit the library, take a look at what the Isothermal Library has to offer. We have a number of presenters tonight. And the first half of our program is going to center upon sports and entertainment. And Rutherford County has quite a history in both areas, sports and entertainment. The second half of the program tonight, following our intermission, will focus on political history of Rutherford County. But to start tonight, we remember probably one of the most famous sports legends of Rutherford County. Our first presenter tonight is Mr. Chivas Bradley. Mr. Bradley is the official historian of Rutherford County. He serves on the Board of Trustees here at Isothermal Community College, and he is a vital part of the planning committee for this series called History Matters. Mr. Bradley taught school in Rutherford County for 34 years. But once an educator, always an educator, because he currently has the task of coordinating the eighth grade Revolutionary War History program that is presented at historic Gilbert Town each year by reenactors of the Ophir Mountain Victory Trail Association. In November, let me tell you now, put this date down. You will want to bring your friends you will want to bring your family. If you find somebody at Walmart, grab them and bring them. <laughs> Thursday, November 3rd. Mr. Bradley will be back that night to talk about the Revolutionary War and Rutherford County's role in the Revolutionary War. Here's the really fun part. All of the pieces are coming together that it looks like we will have a reenactment of an actual Revolutionary War battle right outside behind the library auditorium. It will happen right at dusk. And if you have ever seen one of these reenactments, that is perhaps the most awesome time to see one is right at dusk dusk. So please make plans to be back on Thursday, November 3rd, as we all enjoy that evening talking about Rutherford County and the Revolutionary War. Tonight, Mr. Bradley comes to us with his knowledge of local legend, Forrest Smokey Burgess. You've seen the statue, I hope, in front of the Cool Springs gym. It saddens me that I have had some people ask me, who is that? Who was that? And I'll say, you have not heard about Smokey Burgess? No, looks like he played baseball. Then yeah, he did, and he was pretty darn good at it too. So let's welcome Mr. Chivas Bradley as we remember Smokey Burgess. Smokey Burgess, local sports legend, well-known baseball player in the 1950s and 1960s throughout the United States. As Jay mentioned, he has a statue at the Cool Springs Gym in Forest City, about halfway between the service station where he helped his brother in the off-season and the Legion ball field where he played American Legion ball for Forest City. Smokey not only was a great ball player, 
but he was a great man. I had an opportunity to know him uh, for many years. I, uh, as a child, my dad and I would often drive by his home between the farm where my dad was managing for Dr. Bostick and our home farm. And I always thought, man, there's the greatest, where the greatest ball player that I've ever known about lives. And I didn't know him personally until 1959 when I joined the church where his family was attending, where his family were members. His wife uh, had been a Sunday school teacher. That was, she passed away about two weeks ago. You might have seen the obituary uh, where Ms. Margaret Burgess passed away two weeks ago. And she, she had served as a Sunday school teacher there in that church for about 50 years before she passed away. My younger siblings had her as a Sunday school teacher and loved her. But uh, I, got, I got to talk to Smokey several times between uh, 1959 and 1973 when I got married and moved to the church where my wife had grown up. But uh, Smokey Burgess was a ball player who was very good at hitting especially. He played for the Chicago Cubs. He played for the Philadelphia Phillies. He played uh, for the Cincinnati Reds. He played for the Pittsburgh Pirates and ended his career uh, with the Chicago White Sox in uh, 1967. Smokey was a nine-time All-Star. Now, you might say, well, how was he a nine-time All-Star? Uh, but he played for 18 years. And out of those 18 years, he was chosen to the All-Star team six times. And three of those years, he not only was chosen for the All-Star game, but he, played, he was chosen for the National League All-Stars. So they had the East Division and West Division for three years in 59, 60, and 61. So Smokey got, he was, he was an all-star nine times. And uh, Smokey uh, was named to at least six sports halls of fame. He had 673 career RBIs, mostly as a pinch hitter. And in 1966, when he was the only player to be paid as a pinch hitter, that was his only responsibility during those years, and he was the only major league player to be paid as a pinch hitter only. And during 1966, he had 20 hits as a pinch hitter, just called up when they needed him. And uh, some people... You probably have read five or six different versions of how Smokey got his nickname. Well, uh, Smokey played, he was born in 1927 and he, uh, in Caroline. And he went, he went to try high school and Mr. Forrest Hunt was his coach. And Mr. Forrest Hunt later became principal of Chase High School some 16 years after Smokey uh, graduated from Tri High. But Mr. Hunt was principal at Chase High, and then he became superintendent of Rutherford County Schools, and he was uh, responsible for hiring me to teach. And I talked with Mr. Hunt many times, and often we would talk about tractors, or we would talk about gardening, or we would talk about pruning. But one time, we got on to Smokey Burgess. And I said, uh, Mr. Hunt, how did Smokey get his nickname? I've heard all kinds of stories about it. And he said, well, I'll tell you the truth of it. He said, when Smokey was playing Legion ball for Shelby, I went to Shelby to watch him play. And I, I was in uh, the booth there with the sportscasters, and uh, a lady named Kate Bailey wrote for the Shelby Daily Star. And she was getting ready to call out and introduce the lineup of players. And she turned to me and said, what's Forrest Burgess's nickname? All these other players have nicknames. What's Forrest Burgess's nickname? And Mr. Hunt said, Smokey was about five foot seven inches tall. He had short legs. He weighed about 140 pounds. But he could run like a jackrabbit in those days. 
And he said, I want you to look at Smokey or at Forrest when he's running and see how he smokes the bases. So if you want to give him a nickname, call him Smokey. And that's what they did. That's where his name came from. And you'll read other stories about it, but I believe Mr. Hunt told me the truth of how he got his nickname, that he was fast in those days, even as a short-legged player. Uh, Smokey gained weight later, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But uh, Smokey uh, was a fast runner. Uh, he, was, he was drafted to play for the St. Louis Cardinals as a 16-year-old. And when, when the baseball commissioner found out that he was signing a contract, he said that contract cannot stand. He cannot play professional ball at age 16. So he came back home. But the very next year, the Chicago Cubs called him up and paid him a $3,000 signing bonus. That doesn't sound like much today, but... In, in 1944, $3,000 was one of the largest, if not the largest, signing bonus that a Carolina player had ever received. Smokey took that $3,000 and bought, bought him a, a, a fancy Mercury car. And he drove that Mercury into Forest City, and he, he knew some teenage girls that were working there at the dime store, and he thought, I'll see if I can get those girls to go for a ride with me. And he went into the dime store and he told them, uh, said, asked the girls if they would go for a ride with him in his new car. And they got excited, but, but their supervisor, who was 19 years old, two years older than Smokey, she said, girls, get back to work. You can't go for a ride while you're working. So Smokey began to talk to her. And her name was Margaret Head, and she grew up in the community where I live. And Margaret told him, said, well, if you'll come by my house on Sunday afternoon, we'll see if I can go for a ride with you. And uh, when Smokey got there, she said, well, I'm going to tell you the truth, that I've got a date with another man, another boy later this afternoon, and, and I can't go for a ride with you. And Smokey said, well, just go for a little ride. Let's just go, and it, you, can, you can go on your date later. Well, that, that little ride turned into about five hours, is what I've been told. And so uh, they, they, began, they fell in love and were married within about a year and a half. Uh, Smokey uh, played for the uh, minor league teams on, in, the, in the Cubs organization for two years, and with the war, World War II going on, he ended up going into the Army, went for training at Fort Bragg, and qualified as a light truck driver, went to Germany and was driving a Jeep, and on a little narrow road, that Jeep ran off the road and, and flipped three times and really, really damaged one of his arms. I mean, seriously damaged his arm. So they changed him from a light truck driver to uh, the mail clerk. And they said they had a good, a really good army cook that could cook some of the best fried potatoes you've ever eaten. And Smokey told me later, he said, I ate fried potatoes. He said, I love those things. I kept eating fried potatoes and giving out the mail, and I didn't, didn't get much exercise. And that's why he gained the weight that he gained. So uh, he, 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 he said he weighed about 200 and, uh, 218 pounds at 5 foot and 8 inches tall when he came out of the Army. But he went back to the Chicago Cubs organization, and, and for the next two years, he, he led all hitters in both of those leagues, uh, all, all the, whole, the whole league in which those teams he played for, not just in that, in that uh, team that he was playing for, the minor leagues. But in uh, 1949, the Cubs called him up to play Major League Ball. And he had a pretty successful year that first year, but they sent him back down to the minors in 1950. But in, in 1952, he went to the Phillies uh, after playing for the Cubs into 1952. And while he was playing for the Cubs, he faced Robin Roberts as a pitcher. And Robert, Robin Roberts played for the Phillies, as you know, was one of the greatest pitchers of all time. And Robin Roberts had, had never struck Smokey out. And he, 
Smokey had hit three home runs against him, one on a fastball, and the next two on high outside balls that Robin Roberts thought was going to walk him or strike him out. So when, when Smokey came to play for the Phillies, Robin Roberts sent him a telegram and said, I'm excited that you're coming and let me pitch to you instead of pitching against you. And that's what the telegram said. So uh, Smokey was real excited and, and went ahead and played for the Phillies and did great. Uh, he, he led the Phillies in hitting uh, in 1953 and 1954. Uh, in 1954, he had a point, uh, three, 368 batting average playing for the Phillies for the whole season. Uh, then he was traded in, in mid-season 1959 to Cincinnati. And while he was playing for Cincinnati in 1956, uh, the, the Reds were one game away from breaking the record for the most home runs hit by a single team in a given season. And Bertie Tebbets, who was the manager for the Cincinnati Reds, called Smokey up to pinch hit. And he said, Smokey, hit a home run or nothing. The first pitch Smokey got, he hit a home run over the fence. And, and so the, the uh, Reds that year won, uh, tied for the number of home runs in a given season by an individual team. Um, in 1959, Smokey was traded to the Pittsburgh Pirates. That was the year that I started going to church with Smokey, and I got to know him. And I, I knew him and talked to him while he was playing for the Pirates. In 1960, the Pittsburgh Pirates were up against the New York Yankees in the World Series. Smokey played in five of those games, had 18 hits out of those five games. The Pirates won four of those five games, and of the two other games that they played that Smokey was not in, they lost. So Smokey was in the four winning games that the Pirates won that year against the Yankees, batting against some of the best pitchers in the United States playing for the New York Yankees. Smokey had a 333 batting average in that World Series. Out of the 18, out of the 18 uh, times at bat, he had six hits. And that's pretty good, isn't it, Todd? <laughs> he hit three out of 18. But anyway, uh, Smokey had a very successful season, or time with the Pirates, and then in, uh, in 1965, uh, he, he went over to the, um, <clears throat> to the Chicago White Sox. And while playing for the Chicago White Sox, he most, for almost the entire three years, he was only a pinch hitter and was paid not to catch or to do anything but to pinch hit. And he, he had a tremendous record uh, with uh, the, the White Sox. Um, in 1967, Smokey had an injury, a pulled muscle in his rib cage, and it hurt him so bad to play that he decided to, to step down from Major League Baseball. He came back home and opened Piedmont Carolina Motors in partnership with a, a, a wonderful, well-to-do gentleman who was in a wheelchair a uh, very a financial genius almost, but he in partnership with uh, <clears throat> Mr. Augustine had the, the Piedmont Carolina Motors Dodge place. And I, I was a senior in college and I had a little Chevrolet coupe that I stripped the timing gear in. I was just about out of money and didn't have a car and I was getting ready to do my practice teaching. And I thought, well, if anybody can help me, Smokey Bird just can. I went to Piedmont Carolina Motors, and he showed me a, a 1967 Dodge Coronet 440 uh, with a white vinyl top, two-door hard top, metallic blue. It was a beautiful car. And he said, that's the car 
that I would love for you to have because I want someone to have that car that won't blow it up. Well, that car would register 140 miles an hour, and I hate to admit it with my son-in-law being the sheriff, but I, uh, I, I drove that car 120 miles an hour several times. But, but uh, I'll, I'll not go into all the details on how that transaction took place. But in 1967, Smokey Burgess showed me what a real friend is. And, and from 1967 until 1991, when Smokey passed away, we were friends. And I, I respected and loved Smokey Burgess as much as anybody in the world can. And when, when we have our break, if you want to ask me about that car transaction and how it turned out, I'll be happy to tell you. <laughs> but uh, it, it's amazing how it, how it came down. But anyway, in 1991, after uh, I, I was in a different church and wasn't seeing Smokey regularly, but he, he had gone back to work uh, in, in baseball coaching uh, for the Atlanta Braves. And, and when they interviewed him uh, for that coaching job, he told them, I don't want to be a major league coach unless I can be in a position to help some young ball players." And that's what he did. He helped a lot of young ball players become professionals. But even more than that, he helped a lot of young ball players who were not good ball players and who were not good citizens to become men of character. And that's one thing that a lot of people don't know about Smokey, what a fine Christian gentleman he was. But in 1991, just a, a couple of weeks before Smokey passed away, I was at Rutherford Hospital and there was a big sign on the door, absolutely no visitors. And I didn't know it was Smokey's room, but I went to the room beside of it where my uncle was sick. And as I came out, the nurse came out of the door and left the door about that wide open. And Smokey hollered to the nurse and said, tell him to come in, tell him to come in. And I, I got to spend about 15 minutes where they weren't letting anybody visit him, but I went in for about 15 minutes. And Smokey and I didn't talk about baseball. We talked about his family and how much the doctors had told him he didn't have much time left and how he was regretting having to leave his family. But he said, we talked about heaven. He said, I know where I'm going. And he said, I hate to leave my family. And we shed some tears together and we prayed together and we talked. And as I was leaving, he said, I have a peace. I have a peace. And I'll never forget that visit with one of my favorite people, Smokey Burgess. When it came to baseball, when it came to life, a home run or nothing. During our intermission, a little bit later this evening, you'll want to be sure to stop by. Understand you have some memorabilia, uh, some smoky baseball cards and so forth. And so make sure you talk to Mr. Bradley and take a look at some of the Smokey Burgess memorabilia he has brought with him here tonight. It's time for another Isothermal Community College Library fun fact. Did you know that here at the library, we have newspapers on microfilm that go back as far as the 1800s? Wow. Jacob Conley did not start his newspaper career in the 1800s. But we want to give special thanks tonight. Jacob is in the very back of the auditorium. Jacob is a special consultant. That's the term that Kathy came up with tonight. As she was putting together the program, as she was trying to reach out and contact various presenters, she said, well, if anybody knows how to track down these people, including Jay Coombs, Jacob Conley would know. So our thanks to Jacob. Jacob makes me feel really old. Because he reminds me that he took one of my broadcasting classes and he said, Jay, I was in high school 
By the way, that was 20 years ago. Thanks, Jacob. He went on to Gardner-Webb University. Jacob ended up with a degree in English. He is known not only as a reporter, a writer for the Daily Courier, the Shelby Star, the Gaston Gazette, the Morganton News Herald, the Asheville Citizen Times. The list goes on and on. And his sports and news reporting has involved him with a number of newspapers all over the area. Here's something really cool. Jacob has now become an international reporter. It's amazing what the internet can do. It's amazing what being online can do to connect Henrietta with England. And Jacob is now a writer for the Liverpool Football Club that's soccer, in case you know. <laughs> Located in Liverpool, England. So tonight, special thanks to Jacob Conley for helping us with the program. You, you may say, Jay, that was an awkward... Why, why did you thank Jacob right then? Because I'm getting ready to tell a story. <laughs> and Jacob is in the story. Our next presenter tonight, I don't think he really needs an introduction. He's a legend. He is a class act. When I first looked, I said, Anthony? I don't know who Anthony, Anthony? Chuck, Chuck McSwain. Chuck is a graduate of Chase High School. Yep. All of us know he went on to Clemson University. Outstanding college football career. A running back for the team. How, you've got to know about the 1981 undefeated Clemson Tigers who went on to win the National College Football Championship. In fact, I remember... I was in college at the time, but I can remember watching the Orange Bowl game, New Year's Day, 1982. Here was undefeated Clemson up against Nebraska. And pretty much the winner of that game was going to be able to claim the national championship title. Chuck didn't have a lot of yardage in that game. Nebraska defense, pretty good. But Chuck had the run. About, what, 10, 11 yards? It sealed the deal for Clemson in their victory over Nebraska to go undefeated and win the national title. 1983, Chuck was drafted, if I remember right, not only the NFL, but there was another league back then called the USFL, and there was a team that drafted him as well in the USFL. Chuck chose, though, to pick the Dallas Cowboys. First ever preseason game with the Cowboys, they were playing the Miami Dolphins. Listen to this. Chuck scored not one, but two touchdowns in less than two minutes, including the very memorable. It was just a screen pass play to perfection. 67-yard touchdown. And Chuck said that that game, that night, pretty much sealed him a job, and he became a Dallas Cowboy. Insert Jacob Conley's story here. A few years ago, Jacob went to Dallas, Texas. Well, of course, Jacob says, yeah, I'm going to go out to AT&T Stadium. And Jacob went to AT&T Stadium and he took the tour. And he said he had a really good tour guide. And it was a fairly lengthy tour. And Jacob said, Jay, they kept talking about all these legends. They talked about all the famous cowboy players, the coaches, 
Well, if you know Jacob Connolly, you know if he has a question that he wants answered, he is going to ask it. So after Jacob had heard about all of the famous cowboy players and coaches, Jacob's like, excuse me, when will you talk about Chuck McSwain? And Jacob said the tour guide kind of was a bit startled, shocked, and said, do you know Chuck McSwain? Jacob's like, well, well, I hope so. He was my teacher and assistant principal at Chase High School in North Carolina. And they were absolutely amazed. Jacob knew a former cowboy. And in fact, it's possibly, you know, Chuck had a phenomenal football career. But what he did after football, mm, it's big. It's really big. Because Chuck came back home to Rutherford County. He came back to his alma mater, Chase High School. He served as a teacher. He served as a coach. He served as administrator. I think at one time, athletic director, assistant principal. I don't know that there are too many jobs at Chase High School that Chuck has not been involved in over the years. And he has been at Chase now for over 30 years. He has been an inspiration, a mentor to thousands of Rutherford County School students. Now you are about to see a video clip. This video clip is from 1983. If you are not aware, we did not have high def, we did not have digital television in 1983. We had this thing called video tape. So the quality is not going to be what you are used to watching today on the big screen at home. But it's good. And I think you'll appreciate this. It's a monumental, it, it's just, you could not draw a play up any better than this happened. He is number 35. He was part of the Mick backfield at Clemson University. Let's take a look at Chuck McSwain. Andre Franklin had 47 yards and only nine carries. Most of that in the first half. Boogaboom. Little drop off pass to McSwain, the rookie from the 40, 45. My younger brother Rod. He's a year younger than I am. Uh, he also played in the NFL for nine years with the New England Patriots. He had opportunity to play in the Super Bowl. Uh, they lost uh, to the Chicago Bears at that time. Uh, that's when the Bears was really good with the fridge. And they did, uh, you know, I think it was Super Bowl Quake or something. To, 
Super Bowl shelf with the barrels made up. So, but that was some good old days. I wish I could run like that now, but I even walk. But <laughs> again, I'd like to thank ICC for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, uh, it's, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, I see Mr. Br uh, Bradley. You know, I still, I know his chair was Bradley, but Mr. Bradley, we call him. Uh, he was a teacher when I was at Chase, and uh, I took his class, uh, Ag. It was a great class, and he was a great teacher. The, the, the main thing that I do remember about him is that, you know, he was just, he, he cared about you, but he was, wasn't strict, but, you know, you knew where you stand, and you stood whatever he told you to stand. So, <laughs> so I do remember that. But I was born and raised in Caroline, North Carolina, uh, just, and I went to uh, Tri-Community, which is now Thomas Jefferson. I was one of 13 kids. I had seven sisters and six brothers. We lived in a three-bedroom house. My dad delivered oil for Hawking Oil Company. My mom worked at Cone Mill. And during that time, I always tell the story that when I grew up, that I never fell out of a bed. And the reason is, is that in one room, boys slept in a bed, in a, in a room, girls slept in a room. But we had a bed here and a bed here. But we had rollaway beds. So at night, we rolled out, we rolled out beds. So I could roll from bed to bed over across the room. So I never fell out of a bed growing up. <laughs> so, but it was, it was really a blessing to, to have that man in a family. You know, it comes in handy in a lot of ways, uh, cleaning up. You know, we, was, we had to clean up every Saturday, every Sunday, you know, we went. Never had a chance to uh, really go out to a restaurant. And when I was a senior in high school, I went to the prom. I took my date to Mickey D's. I bought her a Big Mac, and I thought that was the biggest thing around. <laughs> we went to McDonald's. But again, I'd like to thank ICC for the opportunity to be here. My brother Mike also attended ICC back in the 70s. So I was sort of used to coming to ICC. Back then, they had a pretty good sports program. You know, it was well known for basketball. They, they really was really entertaining sports. And so uh, yeah, I had the opportunity to come. Uh, like I said, I was one of 13. My mom and dad was hard workers. My mom didn't believe in football. She wouldn't let me play football. I didn't play until I was in the eighth grade. Then, I, then she let me play band. I joined the band. In the eighth grade, I was in the band. Ninth grade, she let me play football for the ninth grade. Then I had to choose between football and band in ninth grade. Mr. Finley was the band director. So my mom said it was up to me to decide what I wanted to do. She said, you can stay in band or you can, you can uh, quit, uh, stay in football. So, you know, you know what I chose. I quit football and played the band. So my 10th grade year, I come out, I was in the band. Mr. Finley, Gene Finley came to me. He said, I understand that you don't, uh, you're not going to play football. I said, no, I'm not going to play. I'm going to stay in the band. He said, let me talk to you for a minute. He put me to the side. He said, listen, I understand you want to play in the band. You like the band. But listen, you're a pretty good football player. You're a terrible trumpet player. <laughs> he said, he did. He told me the best thing I can do is go back to playing football. <laughs> so I really owe my career to Gene Finley. Because I was, I was going to stay in the band. You know, band was doing a lot of traveling. You know, they went to Myrtle Beach. I'd never been to the beach. And I was wanting to do all those things. But because of Gene Finley, I went back to playing football back in high school. And, you know, if anybody know, back then, Coach Keita, Coach Leffitt, you go from band to football, you're in for a long year. When you go to practice, you make a mistake. You get reminded. You know, you might need to go blow your horn instead of playing football. You know, I was told that several times. But... But they never did held that against me. Uh, you know, I couldn't really go through much without my family. And, uh, you know, you got Coach Keita, Miss Keita, Bob Leffert, Annis Leffert, and really the whole Chase community. During that time in Caroline, you know, we was, I was very fortunate that I had other people to follow. I had Keith Crenshaw, who was, was a year ahead of me. He went to Duke University. We had Billy Ray Vickers, Ray Hurst that went to NC State. Then Eric Young, 
also on the football team with the Clemson. So, you know, even though we was a small area, it came to a point where it was, we all wanted to go to college. And through Chase High School and through the fact that Miss Keeter was also the guidance counselor, she made sure that we took the right classes in order to attend college. So we all, we all had the ability to play football. She made sure we all had the ability in the school. So we were able to do both. We was able to play football and get a free ride to college. On the film, uh, you notice that with two minutes left, there's really more to that than the stories tell. I like to straighten that out just for a minute. Actually, it was the last uh, preseason game. It was during the time it was the last game. And up to the end, I hadn't played. I hadn't played at all. So it was the first quarter. You know, you, you get three preseason games. Each game, they cut other people. You know, you start out with 80 on the team. You play a game on even now. You, play, you see them play on, on Sunday. By Monday, they got a ticket. You go home. They'll wake up that morning. They'll get your airline ticket, and they'll send you home. So it got to the, to, to, it was the last game. And I was sitting there, you know, and I said, well, you got first quarter. I said, I didn't play. I got second quarter. I didn't play. Well, I'm thinking, well, maybe I get third quarter. Third quarter, I didn't play. We got Miami. Well, we got two touchdowns behind, like 13 points behind. Then with two minutes left, just like anywhere else, what they do. A lot of times, you, you know, you, as parents and coaches, you put some kids in in the last two minutes. So that's what Coach Landry did at that time. It was Tom Landry was a coach. So with two minutes left, he put me in the game. So I only had two minutes. The thing about the two minutes is I could have entered the game two ways. One way could be I'd get mad and upset because I hadn't played the whole game, or I had two minutes to show what I can do. So what happened is, well, you saw the run. I broke the run. Then at the end, I scored again later on with about 30 seconds left in the game. After the game, Tom Landry walked up to me, and he said, congratulations, you are Dallas Cowboys. He said, you was two minutes away from being cut. <laughs> See, I could have ended that game with a bad attitude. You know, just like sometimes, as we as coaches and as parents, sometimes we may get a little upset because our kid don't get in the game. Sometimes they get in with a minute left or two minutes left. And you say, ah, oh, what are you putting them in two minutes for? Don't, he talking to the wrong person. I know what two minutes did for me. So if you, if you got two minutes, go in and show what you can do. And that's what I always try to get to across to my kids and, and to the coaches and, and to, you know, I'm coaching the middle school now and the high school. You know, you got two minutes, show me. You know, it, it makes a difference. I, I'm proof of it. I could have entered that game and just didn't try to do anything. And I'd have been back home. But I didn't. But also, I, I like to think, like I said, uh, Miss Keeter, Coach Leffler, and the Chase High community. I was very fortunate at Clemson. In 81, when I first entered, I was the ACC Rookie of the Year. Then, we, like you said, we uh, 1981, we won the National Championship. And also, my mom never attended a Clemson game except on Parent Day. She came. She never came to a – she came to uh, pro games, but she didn't go to the game. She didn't want to see us get hurt, so she didn't come. She came the years that we played New England, that was because my brother was playing and I was playing. We were playing against each other, and she came. And then I'll just be honest about it. When she came, she, she had a little bit more to drink in that day, you know. She needed something to calm the nerves down. <laughs> so, so she, you know, she's up there, she was, she was, she was happy. I can say that much for her. And I also talking about my mom. In my senior year in high school, I got hurt. I only played eight games as a senior. I separated my shoulder during the game. I should have never played the rest of the game, but I kept playing anyway. You know, it was separated. I knew it was, but I wanted to win anyway. But after that, uh, we had an all-star game. After I signed with Clemson, we were playing in Charlotte. And my mom came to the game. Well, you know, I hadn't played in a while. So a couple times when I got hit, I got up. I was doing my shoulder like that. And I could hear her yell and scream and saying, don't go in, don't go in. So, but, you know, I did like that. Well, I, hey, that was the wrong thing to do. 
<laughs> but the third quarter, I was sitting there, and somebody go, she go, I said, oh, what I tell you? I said, don't go back in. That's my mom talking to me. On the sideline, doing the game. And I said, yes, ma'am. And I told the coach, I said, I can't go back in unless my mom let me go back in. <laughs> the coach went over and talked to her, and she said, okay, and she went back in the stands. You know, like I tell everybody, my dad's an easygoing man. My mom, she didn't play. You know, she, 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 whatever she said, it went that way. But like I said, I was blessed and lucky to have both parents and the community. Also, and I've been fortunate to be at Chase High now for uh, over 30 years. Also, but a lot of people don't know too, that before I went to Chase High, I was a prison guard. I was a prison guard at the high rise in Morganton, North Carolina. You know, that's where you go when you're 14, 15, 16 years old. You turn 18, then you go to Raleigh, Central Prison. Part of my job was to take guys once they turn 18, down to Central Prison, uh, 19, depends on how big they are. You had to get them to a certain size so they could handle themselves. So we would take them down and you know, drop them off. You know, a lot of people didn't know that I did that. Why I did it? Mainly because I wanted to see what it was like on the outside. I'm scared. I wasn't about to go in jail, but you know, if I figured if I just do that for a little while, so I did that for the high rise, then I came back to Chase High I started teaching classes, and like I said, I've been there over 30 years now, and uh, I really enjoy it. A lot of them say, ask me when I'm going to retire, I say, well, you know, some things you enjoy, and I really, really enjoy it. My brother, and, uh, like I said, uh, I still have my family that's still around. I have five kids. Uh, one of my kids I named Tiger, after Clemson Tigers. His name is T-Y-G-E-R, but of course, he decided to go where? North Carolina. <laughs> I told him I should have named him Tar Heel. He might have went to Clemson. <laughs> but he did. His name is Tiger. He went to North Carolina. And you know, and the funny thing is, I never took him to North Carolina. I took him one time. I dropped him off. He went and visit. I picked him back up on Sunday, and we come home. <laughs> you know, I know it's cruel. I know it. I know. I shouldn't have done him that way. But you know, I wanted him to go to Clemson. But he, of course, he like any other kid. If that's what I wanted, but he's gonna do the opposite. So now I've learned I should have just pushed him to go to Carolina. He probably would have went to Clemson. But, <laughs> but he's graduated now. He's, you know, he's in San Fran. He's doing well, and uh, it worked out real well for him. Well, I grew up being a Carolina fan. I was always like, you know, basketball program and everything. So, but I was really fortunate. But like I said. I'm really a blessed person in a lot of ways. I've been real fortunate. I've been fortunate enough to, you know, to be able to travel, to see things, uh, to have people that help me out. You don't make it by yourself. You know, there was a lot of things that have happened through life to where you're going to need other people to help you. And that includes teachers, coaches. I had the coaches that one day say, uh-uh, we're not putting up with this. You, you got two choices. You're a great athlete, but you know, either you're going to play or uh, you go home. It was, you know, as simple as that. You, know, you can be one of the best athletes ever, but you got to put forth the effort. And also, you got to do it off the field. You got to do it in the classroom. There's no excuse to saying that, well, he could have made it if he have did the books. That's, said, that's been said too many times. I don't believe in it. And I tell the kids that. I said, don't tell me you can't do it. If you want to play football, if you want to play basketball, if you want to play any sports, then you'll do the school work to play. You'll do whatever is necessary in order to get you to play. Football was my saving grace in that I wanted to play football and I wanted to go to college, but I had to hit the books. And I was fortunate to have other people that were before me that went, so I was able to go visit Duke, watch my friends play, uh, Clemson, uh, Carolina, and, and those opportunities. And, uh, and I really appreciate all that. And I really appreciate the, the, this whole community as when I was growing up. I was really fortunate. It's a great place to be. That's the reason why I came back. I, I was living in Atlanta for a little while. My brother and I was running some business down there. But it, just, it was just 
too big and too hectic. So we decided to move back. So I just, that's when I decided to come back. And I had just, I had my degree. So Ms. Keita at that time had a opened up for career management, technical uh, teacher. So that's what I've been doing for over 30 years now. And I can say, I really enjoy it. Uh, I have a great time at it. And I really like to thank Ms. Weber and the Astro Thurman community uh, for the opportunity to be here. Like I said, I'm really blessed. My brother played eight years in the NFL. I only played four. And like I tell a lot of kids, the NFL. The NFL stands for something else, too. Not for long. <laughs> you know? Because you're going to get hurt. You give a man $100,000, he's going to hit you. Now, you know, it don't matter. Sooner or later, he's going to catch you. Sooner or later, he's going to hurt you. I've been operated on seven times. I was a running back. My brother was a defensive back. So he hit people. If I had to do it all over again, I'd be a, de a defensive back because you don't take as much punishment. The likelihood of a running back in the NFL is two to three years just because you just take a beating. Not so much in the pros, but just to get there. When you're running the ball, you're getting hit. Pee Wee League, you're getting hit. High school, you're getting hit. College. So all that takes its toll. Retirement for the NFL is only three years. You play three years in the NFL, they pay you the rest of your life. You come out 27 years old, you get paid the rest of your life. I mean, nowhere can you work that you're going to be able to get retirement for only three years of work. So that tells you just how tough it is in the NFL. That is very tough. But, you know, if you're forced to get past three years, then they'll pay you the rest of your life. I played four, my brother played eight. So, you know, we're very lucky, you know, on that part. But, you know, but it just shows you just how tough the NFL is. Also, I noticed with uh, Todd Coffey. I talk Todd, no Todd. It's just, you know, I'm the old man around. I said, it's, it's amazing how times fly. And, and the people that you meet, and, uh, and Mr. Bradley, and I see uh, uh Ken, uh, not Ken Hines, I want to call him Ken, but he ain't Ken. That's your brother's name, Kenny Hines. But he was a supervisor when my mom worked at Cone Mill. And I remember going to Cone Mill and watching my mom work. That was hard work. Dolphin. My daddy delivering oil for Hawkins Oil Company. The thing with my family, like I said, was 13. On weekends, we would get the vans from the, uh, Hawkins Fuel Company and take the seats out, I mean, take, put the seats back in. During the week, they used them to deliver oil, gas, and different things. But on the weekend, my parents would take them, put the seats in, and then we'd get in the van and just go on little trips. You know, but trips for us were just going to Lake Lua. You know, we go to Lake Lua, we just pull off to the side, and you know, then we might have a little picnic tables, and then we'd go play in the creek in the water. We never actually went into any place. I mean, that's very hard to do, 13 kids. You pull up Mickey D's, you're say, give me 13 Big Macs and fries. You know, <laughs> you just don't do that. You know, it's the same way when you go to buying clothes. Kids talking about hand-me-downs. <laughs> you don't know what hand-me-downs are, you're 13. And, you know, you're fortunate that people give you things. Back then, we was fortunate that Jim Doggett's shoe store. Jim Doggett, Miss Doggett was my fifth grade teacher. Very sweet lady. But she didn't play. She didn't play. But what she did, what she taught us was this. She played music and the church music and stuff. And she taught us anthems. She taught us uh, grace, but when they eat, how to eat, what put side, put your fork, your spoon on. When you went to lunch with her, you didn't share food. She, she, she wouldn't let you do that. If somebody had something they want to give to you, they had to slide it underneath the table. So if you reached it over, she'd make it right a hundred times. I must not borrow food. You know. <laughs> but, but she was a sweet lady, but I, I just remember her. And her uh, husband ran Jim's dog at shoe store. We would go in, and he would give us shoes. But you no, know, he just put it down on the bill. We, my mom then would pay it the next week or two, or probably a month or two, you know, with that many people. But we was fortunate to have those type of people around. Not many times can you go into a store where they just give you the shoe and then let you just pay later. 
you know. So the, we was fortunate for, to have Jim Dog shoe store there. Also, my brother Tim, which was two years ahead of me, uh, uh, he it was track season. Chase High didn't have a track. We didn't have a track when I was in school. We didn't get it to my senior year. We practiced around the graveyard. You know, at Chase, there's across the street is the graveyard. It was paid. So that's where we practiced. That's why we won the state every year, too. You know what I mean? You run around the graveyard, you're going to get pretty fast. <laughs> you, know, you, just, you, know, you know, you got somebody chasing. You don't know what's out there. You get a little dog. You go, boo, you ready to go. So, so, but my, brother, my brother won it his senior year. And I was playing baseball. And Coach Kitty came to me. He said, uh, you're going to run track. I said, no, I love baseball. He said, no, you're going to run track. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> so next year I ran track. And I had won the state too. But I really loved baseball. But back then, what a coach tell you to do, you do. And in the long run, it worked out for me because I got noticed by other schools and stuff because you know I won the state 100 meters. And back then... When you was a 100-meter champ, you was a 100-meter champ of North Carolina. There's were, there were no 1A, 2A, 3A, or 4A. You ran against everybody. And that's, a, you know, even on our football program, you know, we might have could have won the state sometimes if they had the division. But, you know, we, we had to play, you know, the bigger team who won the smaller schools around. But we still played them pretty good. We had a pretty good record. But... Again, I'd like to thank everybody for the opportunity uh, and, and, and uh, for uh, adding me to, the, to this list. I'm very fortunate. I try to get my brother to come. He's a year younger than me. He's very shy. He don't want to speak. He just, and they, they really don't. But he's a personnel manager, but he don't want to speak. I don't understand that, but <laughs> but that's him. That's where he is. And he, like I said, he played eight years. He's a good fella. He, you know, you know, you would think that he was the bigger brother because he's always. People always ask me, uh, Sergeant, the teacher at school, said, "That's a nice polo." I said, "Yeah, my brother gave it to me. Them nice shoes. Uh, my, uh, my brother gave it to me." And, yeah, you know, I'm older than my brother, but he's still getting, handing me clothes. I'm almost, I'm 60 years old. He's still giving me clothes. But we were real close. That's the one that was a, just a year apart. We was at Clemson. We roomed together. We was roommates. You know, we was roommates growing up. We was roommates when we was at Clemson. So, you know, I was very fortunate to be from that family of 13. I have sisters. You know, they're tough. My sister was tough on us. They were older than us. So they took care of us, you know. They gave up a lot to, to, to provide for us, you know. So when we had the opportunity, to, when we was playing, you know, we helped give back. You know, we helped them get houses and just make things a little better for them and our parents also. So we was fortunate in that, you know. And that's what I try to explain to the kids now is that, you know, help, help other people out. It'll come back to you. Sooner or later, some way, you feel a whole lot better. And I'd just like to thank every, uh, like I said, ICC for the opportunity to, uh, for, for tonight. And uh, I just feel real lucky and blessed. You know, it's, it, the COVID and everything, it's been tough on everybody. I've lost some sisters to COVID. It was tough. It still bothers, but still bothers, because we was close. But, but you know, it's 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 just tough. You know, I I, I tell a lot of times, you know, getting older is good. Like I said, a lot of times I know I'm getting older, and I'm glad that at least I know I'm still here, and uh, it's it's just great. And. I just like to thank everybody for uh, for this opportunity and for including me in the program tonight. And uh, if you ever need anything at Chase High, just give them a call and ask. And if I can help you out in any kind of way, it's no problem. Just let me know and I'll do it. You know, I, I'm still I'm still coaching track and uh, football. So, you know, if you anything else, just let me know. And like I said. I appreciate everybody, and I appreciate it. Good to see Todd 
uh, Mr. Mr. Bradley and several other people. You know, it just brings back some good days. Those were great days. I really enjoyed Chase High School. I really enjoyed being around the people. You know, I, you know, I, I really enjoyed you know just uh, the the kindness and the togetherness that we had back then. You know, but thank you for your time. you know that tonight's presentation, Famous Faces and Local Places, part of the kickoff for the History Matters series, is brought to you by the library at Isothermal Community College. You know what that means? It's time for a library fun fact. Did you know that the Isothermal Library has free Wi-Fi access you can hook up your own laptop, or the library offers 11 computers available for public use. Kathy Webb, for whatever reason, had an interest. She wanted to learn more about the Harris Speedway. Okay. Kathy used one of those computers, and she looked up Harris Speedway. And do you know that she found out that in October of 1964, the king was here. King Richard Petty raced at Harris Speedway. Not only that, but he stayed in the family-owned Gardo's Motel on Main Street in Forest City. I didn't know that. I think Gardles, we need to contact Gardles. I think they need to put in a King Richard Petty room suite. They should cover it with posters of the king. They could put up all kinds of NASCAR memorabilia. It would put Gardles back on the map. Mm. Our next presenter tonight, Major League Baseball player, Justin. I didn't know it was Justin. Justin Todd Coffey, a graduate of Chase High School, former Major League Baseball pitcher. Right out of high school, back in 1998, Todd was drafted by the Cincinnati Reds. Spent 10 years in the Reds organization. Then he was traded to Milwaukee. He played for the Brewers an additional three seasons. Then, uh, this hurts me to say it as an Atlanta Braves fan, he signed with the Washington Nationals. <clears throat> then he signed with the L.A. Dodgers. Good news. Later he signed with the Seattle Mariners and eventually went to spring training with the Atlanta Braves. Yay, 2015. After going to spring training with the Braves, Todd decided he'd like to try something different. Wonder what this game of Mexican baseball is all about. So Todd traveled to Mexico City where he played for the Diablos. Totally different experience. Todd is currently working with the largest scouting company in the world, Perfect Game, helping young baseball players get spotted by colleges and major league teams. Todd had a signature entrance when he was playing major league baseball. We had suggested tonight he should do that for tonight's presentation we said, Todd, we could put you out, start you outside behind the library and have you make your big entrance just like you did in Major League Baseball. He passed. I don't know why, but he said, yeah, I'm good. We have a video to show you as we introduce Todd Coffey. This is the signature move that the Major League Baseball fans absolutely loved. It is a classic moment. This is Todd Coffey. 
will have to employ their third pitcher and listen to the Milwaukee fans for Todd Coffey. He used to pitch here, and they like this routine. They're timing him on the scoreboard. He makes it to the mound, 13.45. Hey, you can talk about closures with Hell's Bells and all the music and all the sound effects. This guy running in for the bullpen, Todd Coffey. Now that's excitement. Funny story about that video is I was actually a visiting player going into Milwaukee. And nobody ever gets their music played as a visiting player. And I, they loved me so much there in Milwaukee that they played that as I was a visiting player running in to pitch against the Brewers, which I did good and dominate against that day. But it was fun. I enjoyed it. And first, I'd like to thank the college for having me here today. Um, I'm honored, blessed just to be here, to have you guys go down memory lane with me. Um, it, it's hard to believe. I reflect daily about playing uh, Major League Baseball, and I, I still can't believe I did. Um, it was an honor, a pleasure. Uh, I grew up here in North Carolina, uh, Rutherford County. Uh, went to Chase High School. Chuck was actually one of my teachers. And I remember baseball has been instilled in me as something literally as a little kid. I remember seeing pictures of me in diapers and wind up pitching and, and just loving every minute of it. Um, <clears throat> I remember playing at Crow Park here just with everyone else, Little League, enjoying my time, fun. And that's what it's about. The game was all fun. And it still is today. Uh, and I remember going to Chase High School, and, and my dream was to play professional baseball. Uh, I played football my first year. And, and then, you know, not my son's here. He's not going to like to hear this, but I really wasn't that good a student my freshman year. Uh, didn't really have the, the desire and the drive to, to realize what it was going to take. Um, after that first year playing football, uh, I realized that I want to play professional baseball, and to get there, I was going to have to go to college. Well, at that moment, I remember talking with Chuck about it. I remember talking to my parents about it. I had to hunker down. I had to focus on my grades. I had to focus on everything to, to get to what I wanted. Uh, I remember my mom and dad taking me to tryout camps all over, everywhere. I mean, Florida. Back then, to get spotted is really hard in Major League Baseball, along with any other sport. And I remember my mom and dad taking me to these trout camps. Uh, we'd go on the weekends, um, drive down there, and uh, I remember always, before I went out there, I wanted to play my music. Uh, and my mom and dad hated every minute of it. It's terrible music. And now I understand why, because I listen to my son's music, and I hate it. It's terrible, I tell you. Uh, but my mom and dad took me everywhere. Um, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be there. So I remember uh, getting drafted in 98. Um, this is before cell phones, before internet. Um, my kids don't know what the cell phone without a cell phone would be. Um, but I remember we had an American Legion game that night. Um, our phone lines were cut during the major league draft, and that's where teams would call you and say, hey, would you sign? Are you willing to sign? Uh, and I was like, I got no phone line, so I can't answer anything. I remember being at the American Legion game, and uh, my brother comes running with a paper in his hand, um, let me know I was drafted. Um, couldn't believe it. 41st round, which there's only 50 rounds, but hey, I got drafted. I was unbelievable uh, at that moment. And I remember, I, we still didn't have a phone line. We still couldn't have anybody call us and tell us about it. And I remember Steve Crane um, come by the house, and just knocked on the door. He was a scout that drafted me and said, hey, Congratulations, you've been drafted by the Cincinnati Reds. Um, now go to college. And I'm like, well, I don't really don't want to go to college. Um, I, want to, I want to start my pro career. Uh, so I remember taking Steve in there, and I show him this box full of all these colleges, want me to go play, uh, scholarship, offers, and do it under the bed. I said, listen, I want to play professional baseball. My goal 
is to be in the major leagues. Uh, I'm 17 years old, and he's like, hey, wait a second. You're not supposed to want to go now. What we're going to do is we're going to draft to follow you, and then we'll sign you next year for more money. I was like, I don't want that. I want to bet on myself. Uh, I want to learn from the professionals and go. I want to go. And he said, hold up. I'm going to have to call someone. See, back then, if you got drafted, they were required to offer you a contract. Um, and I said, I'm going to sign it. He said, well, it's, it's $1,000, and it's, we'll give you more money next year. And I'm like, no, I'm going to sign it. Well, this is back when Marge shot on the team. And, and Marge shot, many people in baseball don't know, she was the biggest cheapskate ever. Like, literally, I've, I've been told she would go by offices and cut off light switches with people still in there because trying to save money. Uh, so Deshaun Watson, he was the farm director, had to call Marge Schott and tell her, hey, he's going to sign. Well, Steve comes back in and says, hey, I need you to talk to Deshaun Watson. He, he gets on the phone and he talks to me and was like, hey, you need, you need the congratulations on getting drafted by the Reds, but go to college. I was like, listen, if I go to college, I'm going to go to a four-year university. I'm going to get a degree, um, which was a bluff. I really didn't want to go at that moment. Uh, I wanted to go play professional baseball. So I told him, hey, I'm going to sign this contract, and I'm going to go play and learn. And I didn't come in the mindset of, hey, I'm going to be in the pros in two years, one year. Uh, I went in the mindset of I need to learn and develop and get better. Um, so here I am. 17 years old, can't even sign the contract. My mom and dad had to sign the contract for me. I, I couldn't even sign it. Um, signed it. Uh, they said, all right, you're going to plane out to Billings, Montana. Uh, this is back when they didn't have rookie league, and I was going out there with all these college kids who just got drafted by the Reds. Uh, 22, 23 years old, uh, went out there, and they said, hey, you're not going to play at all this entire season. You're going to sit there and learn. So I remember getting out there, and uh, Billings, Montana, which – the second time I ever flew in my life. First time we flew from New York after our van got stolen. Great story. Uh, but I get out there, and I remember I'm going to go to the ball field. So I went out to the ball field, and uh, <clears throat> one of the, the president of the club there, the Meyerly Club, decided to show me around everything. I said, yeah, I want to see everything. So he takes me a tour of the fields. He takes me a tour of uh, the front office. Uh, we go in the visiting locker room, go into – the home locker room, and then we're in the home locker room. I said, okay, so, uh, you know, where's my, where's my locker? And, and, you know, I started undressing and get ready to go. He said, well, you really don't have a locker. Um, you just hand stuff to players they need. Well, he thought I was a visiting clubby. Uh, he didn't think I was an actual player. So when I got out there, he thought I was a clubhouse attendant. Uh, so for me, it was a big shock uh, going out there and just really growing up. I'm 17 years old. I brought out, you know, sweatpants because I thought that's how we practice. Didn't realize we practice in full uniform. Uh, and it was just a huge culture shock to me. And going out there and just seeing how growing up, 17 years old from here and going out to Billings, Montana, I remember the uh, Rick Burleson said, all right, you have two days in the hotel we pay for. The practice is at 1 o'clock every day. See you at practice. And I'm like, oh, Okay. So me being 17 years old, about 2,000 miles away from everything that I knew in this county, um, I remember many times calling my mom and dad and like, hey, what do I do now? Um, so, and they guided me all the way through every step. Uh, and, I, and I remember that, that season, I was probably about 360 pounds because I was a big kid in high school. And they said, hey, listen, you come into spring training like this, here's your ticket. You're out, you know. Uh, so I remember getting back home and getting all the way down to about 225 pounds, coming into spring training, showing that I'm ready to, to learn. Um, I remember getting off the plane, and one of the guys didn't even recognize me. Uh, and so I get started. Everything's looking good. And then, unfortunately, I had a Tommy John surgery uh, in 99. And, and 99 Tommy John surgery was uh, flip a coin whether you're coming back or not. Uh, I remember going in with Casey McAvoy. He had the surgery right before me. I had it after. He never threw a baseball ever again. Um, I remember hard, hard work. Through. It took about a year and a half um, to get back from it. Um, and then I remember coming back, and it just started kind of clicking a little bit better, and things started working. Uh, I remember going to Double uh, A Chattanooga and having probably one of the better years I've ever had um, and just put me on the map. Uh, I remember going out to the Arizona Fall League. It's where they sent all the prospects, uh, doing well. And then the following year, I get put on the 40-man roster. 
Um, the 40-man roster, I all come to spring training. That doesn't mean you're, you've made the team yet. It means you get the opportunity. Uh, and I remember I was supposed to be the first one cut. They are like, yeah, he's going to be the first one cut. He's the first time on the 40-man. That's usually what happens. He's gone. Um, those guys, we got put on backup pitcher. So if somebody who's made the team doesn't do well, hey, we get a chance to pitch. Well, I was lucky enough that a guy of guys didn't get a chance and didn't do well, and I got to come in to pitch. Uh, so I made the most of them opportunities. Um, and by the end of spring training, it was down to me and one other guy to, to make the roster. Um, and I remember we were battling back and forth. Uh, I remember going out there. I'd pitch first, then he'd pitch after me. Then vice versa would flip-flop back and forth, uh, me and Joe Valentine. And I remember, okay, I had Minnesota Twins, which I hate them to the day, uh, <laughs> really bad. So I remember going out there and pitching against the Minnesota Twins in spring training. Well, I give up a seven spot. And he give up nothing. Well, I knew right then, hey, I'm, I'm out the door first thing in the morning. Uh, one of the last cuts of spring training uh, this in, in 05. And then I remember being there for about 12 days in AAA. And uh, a guy got hurt. I was in uh, Richmond. And I remember... Uh, I didn't pitch. I was a closer, and I was supposed to pitch. And I was like, what's going on? Am I getting sent down? Uh, and I remember they come in there, and they say, hey, you're going up. And I remember calling my dad. Mom. And just telling him, hey, all the hard work paid off. We did it. We made it. Um, and it just is surreal to me that I actually got the opportunity to play. I remember being in, in Richmond, and uh, we went up to Cincinnati and uh, Major League debut. I was like, I couldn't believe it. First guy I faced, Derek Lee. First pitch, foul ball back. Next pitch, 700 feet home run. So, uh, <laughs> welcome to the big leagues. So... Uh, and I would love to give up more home runs every day now to still play. And I, I think for me that to, to be able to make it there and to, it, the years it takes and the work, and, and like Chuck said, the support staff you have to have to get there is, is so important. And this county has brought that to me. Everybody has. Um, and, and I know it's, you know, it's famous, pace, uh, famous people, local. I don't consider myself famous. I'm just a hometown boy who got lucky and got to make it. Um, I, I reflect on it daily, weekly, and I would trade it to do it again because I got to travel and see so much and see so many people and, and just the camaraderie you have with everyone and to grow with them. I mean, I grew 17 years in Rutherford County, then I grew 17 years outside of Rutherford County, and just the, the amazing the camaraderie you have with sports and, and how important it is for the youth to have that. It, is, it's, it's, it really is important because you have all these guys together working for one goal and that's to win games, but that's also to uplift and to love on each other and to help everybody else out. Um, it's nothing like, it's hard to describe what it is to go into a locker room with literally guys all over the whole world. And you all, they may not speak the same language, but the moment you get on the baseball field, you speak the same language. Um, and for me, going down to Mexico, I really got to see what these players who didn't speak English went through in reverse. So they come to the States, they don't speak English, they don't understand what's going on. Well, I went to Mexico, I didn't have any translators. I didn't speak one bit of Spanish. Um, I took French in high school, big mistake. Um, but get down there and just and try to learn their culture, learn the different aspects of it. But it was still baseball once once the game started. And I think that's one thing that I enjoy now, being able to, to teach and to help these younger kids achieve the dreams. There is a college somewhere that a kid can play baseball at. And that's what I love to do is find these kids who weren't supposed to make it. Uh, and 
get them the opportunity and the strive and to get to where they need to get. Um, I was not supposed to make, make it at all. I was a 41st round draft pick. I was supposed to be there for a year, year and a half, and out the door. Um, but I didn't believe that. I believed I was going to make it and believed in my heart that I was going to get there. And I, I just, it, every day it's just surreal to me that I actually made it. Um, I'm honored to be here to talk to you about it. Um, you may see me down the road at Walmart. If you want to ask me more about it, ask me. Um, it's just something that I've been passionate about to help the kids now get to the goal of being college players. Uh, not every kid's going to make it to the big leagues. It's just the truth. But there is somewhere that kids can play. Um, and the fun fact is there has been, in the history of baseball, only t less than 20,000 Major League Baseball players in the history of the game. And, and, and we have quite a few history here in the county. So, I mean, um, I'm honored to be here tonight. Um, if you ever have any questions for me about playing, I would love to, to, to answer it. Um, like I said, I'm just a hometown boy who got lucky to make it, to play. And, you know, if it wasn't for the support of the county, my family, my friends, my mom, my dad, I wouldn't do it. Um, and I like to end every speech with, with something that's important to me. Um, freedom is not free. And support our veterans and support our member, military members. Thank you all. Todd will probably not remember this, but back when he played for the Milwaukee Brewers, he had finished the season, and I believe it was a Friday night in October. I was broadcasting a high school football game out at Chase. Todd popped into the press box. I was working with Scott Bowers at the time, and Scott said, hey, hey, look, Todd's here. I said, yeah. He says, I'm going to get him for halftime. We'll do a halftime interview. I said, sounds great. So we got to halftime, and I had the chance to interview Todd. And I thought I was setting him up for the answer I expected to get. And he threw me a curveball. Because I asked Todd, I said, wow. I said, you have made it to the major leagues. I said, you have played in some of the most famous ballparks. You have been to all of the great cities all over the nation. I said, coming back to Rutherford County must be a bit of a culture shock. And he kind of looked at me and he says, oh, no, this is home. That always stuck with me. Because you can take somebody out of Rutherford County. But once you have lived in Rutherford County, I don't think you can ever take Rutherford County out of the person. It's time for another library fun fact tonight. I bet you know that libraries have books. Would you like to guess how many books are currently in the Isothermal Community College book collection? We're talking about the actual hard books you can hold in your hand. Over 26,000 books in the rooms behind us. But did you know they also have music on CDs? They have movies on DVDs? And you can listen and watch these either here at the library or they are available for checkout. And the library is open to the public and open to the community. And what if you are looking for a book and you cannot find it? Maybe you have even been to other libraries in the county. Well, the Isothermal Library has a very awesome interlibrary loan program that connects them with hundreds of other libraries 
so that they can borrow from the other places and have that book sent here. At this time, special thank you. And if you are here tonight, please stand to be recognized as I call off your name or at least wave from where you are sitting. But I want to recognize the planning team for the History Matters series. I will begin with the library specialist here at Isothermal Community College because she is going to come up and say a few words in just a minute. That would be Kathy Webb. Also serving on the committee, historian Alice Bradley. Also serving on the planning team, historian Mr. Chivas Bradley. A history teacher in the REACH program here at the college, Angel Ledbetter. Nonfiction writer, Sally Matheny. A career coach at Western Piedmont, Jennifer Stevens. Our thanks to the planning team for putting together History Matters. And now, where is Kathy? There you are. Come on down. You are the next contestant. If you don't think that Isothermal Community College improves life by learning, I'm on the stage behind eight awesome speakers here with eight awesome speakers, and I'm an alumni from Isothermal. So Isothermal does improve life by learning. I'm the commercial, but I'm on stage with them. Um, I just wanted to tell everybody, first of all, thank you all for being here. These, these people have put so much effort into this. I've always heard... If you're going to have a party, invite twice as many people as you expect to be there. So I invited eight speakers. Lo and behold, I had eight speakers to say yes. And I'm very grateful to every one of them. I appreciate them so very much. We are, doing, we are starting to reach out to the community here, and we're going to be having more of these. It, actually, we will have a presentation every first Thursday from now through the end of um, spring semester through May. It'll be the first Thursday of every month at 6.30, and it will only last an hour. This was the kickoff with all the fanfare, and I'm so proud and thankful for everybody that's come. We have some awesome presentations coming up, and I really believe that everybody that's spoken so far could have done a whole one by themselves. So I thank you for that, but we will be having... Um, some really good ones in your program, toward the back of your program, it's got our list. We're also doing some community reach out. <clears throat> I've talked a lot today. We're also doing some community outreach, and Spindale Public Library has agreed to let us come on October the 16th and do a, a story time presentation with their children. They do that every Tuesday, but they're letting us come in that particular Tuesday and do it. And we're very excited about that. We like to do that for any daycare or, or school that would want us to do that or library that would want us to do that to let you know that Isothermal is really proud to be a part of the community and thankful for the outreach that we have. We're fixing to take, we're going to have another person that Jay's going to tell you about in just a minute, and he'll be the last person of our first half. When we break, all of our guests, and I need to tell the guests this too since I've got them together, all of our guests will be exiting as soon as Rick sings. After Rick sings, all of our guests will meet me and we'll go out. They are going to go out into the library and be sitting at different stations in the library to spend a few minutes with you as you come through. So if you will, I know that it's, it's later in the evening, but if you will be considered their time, they've told us that it, you know, they are there, they'll sign autographs, they'll speak to you, they'll have your pic their picture made with you if you use your own camera and do a selfie or whatever, but they will meet and greet for a little bit, and then we'll come back in here for the second half. Uh, just go out of either one of these doors. We're going to have some pe some of our guest speakers will be on this side and some will be on this side. And during that time, Jay's going to explain to you 
about our drawing that y'all filled out the cards for the door prize drawings tonight. We've got some good drawings while the rest of us exit out to be set up. Thank y'all. The early 1980s were an exciting time to be involved with country music. I know that because in 1980, at the age of 19, I was a country music radio DJ in my hometown of Evansville, Indiana. And then that year, I made the move to Oklahoma to go to college, and I landed the overnight job at a radio station called KVOO in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And a new group had just put out an album called My Homes in Alabama. Rick Scott, multi-platinum, award-winning songwriter, has more than 40 years in the music business. Rick came on board as the drummer for a band called Wild Country, the band that did become Alabama. Scott was with the group more than five years, and it's quite possible that some of you may have seen the early Alabama perform at the Bowery in Myrtle Beach. Rick was with Alabama during their first three album releases. He co-wrote the hit country song, Why Lady Why, with Teddy Gentry. Rick is the only non-family member who has ever been contracted with the band. A couple of years ago, <laughs> he's on YouTube too. A couple of years ago, Rick joined the band Alabama on stage once again at the Bowery in Myrtle Beach. First time that the original group had pulled back together in 40 years. It was the 75th anniversary of the Bowery, a great event televised by CMT. Rick continues to write and produce new projects along with his wife, Deborah. Together, they released a Christian album a couple of years ago titled Thorns. And the year before that, the North Carolina Gold album. Scott has recently released a few other albums. You can find those on Spotify, Apple Music, other music sites. In your program, there is a website that you can visit at debrickmusic.com. He is now a local resident. Let's welcome Rick Scott. Thank you all. Can you excuse me for just one second? Note time. It's not that I accomplished that much in life. It is that I do forget things, so <laughs> we'll go with that. My name is Rick Scott. I appreciate the intro. Thank you so much. May I lift this a little? Is everyone doing great tonight? Yeah. Me too. I'm so proud to be here. And when Kathy asked us to be a part of this, I mean, there was no way that we could refuse that. Um, no matter what it would have been, it would have been a beautiful thing just to be a part of this community, this college, and all of you people would never have missed this. Thank you. There is a lot of history that I am very proud of. I've been a lucky person in my life, very blessed, very blessed. I started playing music at a very young age. There was eight children in my family. Two of us were musicians, my oldest brother and myself. He went on to be a great guitar player working with all kinds of Opry stars and working the Opry every weekend. He was 12 years older than me. 
I used to be at home, and my mother would call us in the house on Saturday nights to watch him on TV. And as a young boy, it was a beautiful thing to understand that my older brother, who used to help take care of us kids, could do the things that he did coming from Kentucky like we did, and we were poor. We had nothing, but we had a beautiful family, beautiful parents, and we had desire to live life to the fullest. So watching him, I grew up understanding that uh, all things are possible. And uh, no matter what the circumstances may have been at home, that uh, with a little bit of effort and a whole lot of love, I decided to play drums as a young child. And I knew that if I put my heart and soul into it, that one day I could ride those drums right out of poverty and the circumstances. And that is exactly what I did. Starting at a very young age, excuse me, I was 16 years old when I did finally make it to Nashville, thanks to my older brother and a lot of contacts that he had. He was a session musician, guitarist playing on many artist albums, and the Grand Ole Opry, as I said, and he played with many artists on the road. So I did have a real leg up, no doubt. But I had to do my part too, so I spent years, but at 16, I became a session drummer, playing on a lot of albums for a lot of people. The studio was down on Music Row in Nashville. It was owned by a man named George Lewis. And George saw opportunity at all, all times. Well, he called me one day, and I was actually visiting my parents out of town, out of state. And he called me and he said, you need to get back down here. And I said, I just got here. I just arrived the night before really late, and it was uh, several hundred miles, and I hadn't seen my parents in quite some time. He said, you need to get back here as quick as possible. There's some kids playing music. They are recording at the studio, and you need to meet them. They were, uh, at the time, looking for a drummer. So I said, sure, sure, I'll be back. I drove back down the very next day, said a quick bye-bye to mom and dad, drove myself back to Nashville, and the group that I was meeting was Wild Country, which was Randy Owens, Teddy Gentry, and Jeff Cook. Little did I know that the next five years with the band would last over 40. It's been a beautiful career. It's been a wonderful opportunity. Almost five years with the band, several years at the Bowery. I don't know if any of you have ever been to the Bowery in Myrtle Beach. Any hands? You can confess that you've been in the Bowery in Myrtle Beach. You can. It has a, a reputation that uh, <laughs> nobody can, can touch as far as bar rooms. It's uh, named one of, the, one of the top ten honky-tonks in the United States, so you get what I'm, I'm saying on when I speak about the Bowery. Anyway, I did leave the band after five years. We had, had a, a, lot of, a lot of success uh, in the beginning. I mean, I mean it was pretty good. Uh, the albums were selling well. The songs were doing great on the radio. We thank you for radio. I had two uncles, by the way, that were in radio all their lives, 50 years apiece, and uh, they were disc jockeys. And that was something that helped me also. Anyway, after leaving the band, I had the opportunity to work with a man by the name of Earl Thomas Conley. I don't know if you all are familiar with Earl. Uh, wonderful songwriter, singer, and uh, working with Earl was a, a truly a gift. As a songwriter myself, I learned so much from that man. He was a very quiet man. I was the only other guy 
in his entire career, and he went on to do wonderful things, Earl did, but I was the only other guy that he ever co-wrote with. Everything was written on his own. Do you all recall a song named Smoky Mountain Memories? If you do, I mean, here we are. Smoky Mountain Memories was a beautiful song. It was uh, a number one song for Earl as a songwriter. This is before he got a record deal. But uh, just an excellent song, and I always loved it even before I ever met Earl. Uh, so it was a real joy to be around him. I worked with Earl for a couple of years as his drummer and co-writer and studio musician on the recordings. Another blessing in my life. I did leave Earl when I was offered a job with the Man in Black. I was offered a job at John, John Cash's publishing company called the House of Cash. And that was in 1980. And it was his silver anniversary, 25 years in the business. And actually, there was a, a beautiful story. Me and my wife were talking. Miss Deborah here, Miss Beautiful Deborah. Her and I did not know each other at that time. But as we spoke and we started figuring things out, we just we realized that, wow, you were there too. You were at that night. You were in that place the same time I was. So it just, there were so many just, it, I guess I'm trying to say it just meant to be uh, 40 years of, of things happening. But uh, working for John was beautiful. That's the only thing I can say. The Cash family, uh, it truly was a family. And uh, being away from a lot of my own family, it was a beautiful thing to be a part of. And uh, so I get a phone call from John one day after I was hired. He called me personally at my home. I was hired as a staff songwriter and helping to run the publishing company. And I was getting all kinds of experience in that regard. But he called one morning. He said, Rick, what are you doing? And, of course, I felt the need to say, I'm, I'm writing, which I was not. It was early morning. But he said, I want to invite you down to Jack Clement's studio today. Jack being Cowboy Jack, the studio there in Nashville, famous, famous producer and studio owner. But I went down, John had invited me, I went down, and I was just thrilled to be there. And I was going up the steps, it was, the actual studio was in the attic, and I was going up the steps, and I could hear a little rehearsing thing going on, but I could hear John talking, coming through the speakers. And I knew the studio and the setup and all that stuff and how it was all put together, but I got upstairs, and I'm standing there, and there's a lot of people in there that day. Uh, people like to hang around John. Anyway, George Jones was there, and others, and uh, I had no idea, no idea whatsoever, but he recorded two of my songs that day, and there's, there's nothing that... Uh, I can say there's no words for it than to, I mean, if you hear Johnny Cash singing one of your songs and you're standing there watching him do this, it was a beautiful, absolutely beautiful moment in my life and a moment I never dreamed could ever happen. Uh, and I'd had number one songs already. Other artists recorded some of my songs. But when Johnny Cash records one of your songs, and as they say, it's no longer your song. Period. I, uh, I've had a long, beautiful career with a lot of wonderful, beautiful artists and people. I am here in Rutherfordton because of my wife. Deborah Milliken, she runs the Becker House over here, 
and we are very proud of the Beckler Gold history. And being here has been so wonderful. I have lived a lot of places because of my life and being a traveler all my life. All my life, here I am. At the end, not the total end, but slowed way down in life. And what a place to be to slow it down, think about things, and no doubt, no doubt, we are still writing songs, Deborah and I. We write songs and we run our own publishing company these days. And we do a lot of work. We do a little magazine. We do all sorts of things in the music. And we are still deep into it. It's not over. But what a place to do it at. We live out a little bit. And it's nice and quiet. Just her and I. Our kids are raised. Our grandbabies are beautiful. And what a wonderful time in life to have what we have and to share with anyone, anyone who cares to share. I thank all of you for being here this evening. I thank the college. I thank Kathy. We thank Kathy. And we sure do appreciate your time and for allowing us to be here. And as the others have said, and by the way, I'm very humbled by all of the speakers tonight. You learned so much. And I tried to be a football player. <laughs> that didn't work out too well. I had a some notes here to go by, but honestly, uh, as beautiful as they are, I just wanted to talk. I just wanted to talk. Now, if any of you have any questions, you might. Um, when we take our break here, I'll be glad to answer anything that, that anybody asks or to sign anything anybody would like signed. Uh, over my lifetime, uh, I've had the privilege and then I've had the embarrassment sometimes of signing things that uh, people ask you to sign. And uh, he's laughing, okay. Anyway, so, so yeah, we're here, all of us, and we're more than happy to uh, oblige. Um, while in 2019 we were invited, I've got to tell this story. 40 years had passed. And this is like the coolest thing ever. It had been 40 years since I had been inside the Bowery in Myrtle Beach. I had no desire to be in the Bowery in Myrtle Beach. I, I was kind of past all that. And I'd actually survived the Bowery in Myrtle Beach. And I was proud of that fact. So in 2019, my wife and I, we get a call from Jeff Cook guitar player with the band. It's the 75th anniversary for the Bowery. And it is the 50th anniversary for the band. And Jeff Cook asked me so graciously, he said, Rick, you really need, even though you haven't been in the band for years, you really need to be down here and to experience our 50 year anniversary. And I was never so proud in my life. And the owner of the Bowery, who we've been friends since he was a kid selling t-shirts on the boardwalk. He owns the Bowery and has for 35 years. He called. So they both had called me and asked me if I would come down, my, me and my wife Deborah, if we'd come down to celebrate what was a beautiful, anniversary for both places, both things. So we went, Deborah and I, and the night was absolutely gorgeous. All the, the big wigs in town, the mayor and all these people, you know, were there, which I couldn't believe in that little dump Bowery. They were in there though, and they got up and spoke, and it was just a wonderful thing, and plaques were being given out, and people were, you know, blowing each other's dresses up, and it was just a, a beautiful night, but they were very sincere. 
Uh, we got to do, I don't know who, who said this or who came up with this, probably Randy. I'd say Randy Owen. Uh, we're only doing one song. We're only in here. We're going to do one song. And I thought, okay. I had no idea, none, that I would be invited up on stage with them to play drums once again in the Bowery on that little tiny Bowery stage after all these years of seeing all the awards and accolades and beautiful things. Randy called me up on stage. My wife and I were sitting at the front table. I don't know why they kept insisting we sit there when we showed up earlier in the day. And we had spent the day with Jeff Cook riding around in the golf cart and talking and hotel room. But anyway, they insisted on us sitting at this the front table. And I, I do not like to sit at a front table, especially when there's a band. They're loud. But we were sitting there, and Randy actually got up on stage with the rest of the guys and invited me up. And it was one of the most touching moments in my life. It was so surreal. I was sitting at a table with chairs that were the same exact tables and chairs 40 years prior with all of the cigarette burns, all of the beer stains, all of the smell of the Bowery. Man, it never smelled so good as it did that night. And I was so proud that we were together and being called up and off came my jacket, man, I'm ready. I don't care what song they call out, I am ready. And of course, one of the most difficult as a drummer with that band was mountain music. I mean, right? So we did mountain music and it came off just great. We had a wonderful couple days and uh, I wouldn't trade it for the world. And I thank God, I thank our beautiful, loving God for every single moment of my life and for all the beautiful gifts that have come my way without me even knowing it was ever going to happen or thinking that it would ever happen. And why me, Lord? I thank all of you again. So if uh, you don't mind, uh, oh, I was telling you, I'm sorry, the end of the evening at the Bowery, the band was gifted with each a guitar. There was only five of these guitars made in the entire world. And uh, one for the owner of the Bowery, of course he had to have one, Victor, and one for the four of us in the band. And by the way, our first number one record happened at WESC out of Greenville, South Carolina. Bob Hooper in the mornings. Anyway, thank you guys for listening to me a few minutes. Um, like I said, we'll be back here on a break and uh, anything you may want to talk about. If it's the band or something, I mean, not anything, but close to. I'd like to introduce you to a first number one song I ever wrote in my life and introduce you to the guitar we were presented. So give me just a second. Get set up. Thank you all for coming out.
This is the guitar that was given us. I'm more than proud to try to screech this song out, but I'm so proud of it. Uh, I think I was 17, 17 years old when I wrote this song. Why, lady, why can I leave you? Try, lady, try With the feelings too strong You stay on my mind I feel like a fool Tell me why, lady It was easy before I try, lady, try It ain't easy no more To be on my way Would be the best thing for me to do Tell me why, lady, why can I get over you? Tell me why, lady, why can I get over you? Thank you. By the way, gentlemen, I'm the first one to the restroom. <laughs> I, ha I have great news for you, too. The restroom is right outside that door. You are the closest one to it. <laughs> Okay, at this time, we would like to excuse all of our presenters. Uh, presenters, like to have you step up the steps, exit left side of the stage. Uh, they will be setting up in the library uh, where they have uh, collections of memorabilia. They will be happy to talk to you for a few minutes, autographs if you'd like. Uh, so we'll go ahead and let our presenters first head to their station, I guess we could say, in the library. And Kathy, I, I know we have the cards to fill out for the door prizes. Uh, does somebody have? Okay. Got, okay. Oh, this chest right up here on the front of the stage so as you now rise and prepare to head out for the break be sure to drop your card off 
Door prizes are really, really cool, so don't refrain. Don't miss out on your chance to win. Just drop your card in this chest basket up here on the front of the stage. Now, ladies, your restroom is right outside the door on the left side of the stage. In fact, there's a sign there that says women's restroom. Gentlemen, your restroom is on the far side, the right side, right outside the right side door. We will take a short intermission, allow you time to visit with some of our presenters, and then we will be back for the second half of History Matters. We're going to finish it up so you folks can go home and get some rest. I just had a birthday, and I'm getting old, so I'm going home to go to bed, too. <laughs> okay, so you told them what? Yeah, I told okay. them we've modified it, that we're not going to have the last two. Okay. Cindy Hunt Martin. Well, she retired from ISIL Thermo Community College a couple of years ago. She is currently enjoying her retirement, as am I. Also, she enjoys time with her grandchildren. Now, Cindy is here this evening to share briefly about her father, Dr. John Jackson Jack Hunt. Jack spent 40 years as a dentist in Cliffside before entering politics and serving in the North Carolina House of Representatives for 22 years, from 1973 until 1995. He was Speaker of the North Carolina House several terms. Jack was an amazing man who gave back to both Rutherford and Cleveland counties in many ways. And now, <laughs> cue the video. To begin the presentation, th this documentary, very well produced, uh, I believe produced by some folks at Gardner Webb University, but this video tells us a lot about Dr. Jack Hunt. Jack and Ruby Hunt were born a few hundred yards and four years apart in Lattimore, North Carolina. Jack's father was the dentist and local businessman, and his mother worked at the post office and later boarded teachers. He had two sisters and one brother who worked as teachers and in business. Ruby's family worked as farmers and co-owned a cotton gin. Her three sisters and one brother were involved in farming, teaching, and business ventures. Jack and Ruby graduated from Lattimore High School and she attended Appalachian State University, where she was elected by her classmates to the May Court. Jack graduated from Wake Forest University and then Emory School of Dentistry. After several years of courtship, they were married in June 1946 and settled in Cliffside, North Carolina to practice dentistry. World War II broke out and Jack was called to practice dental surgery at Fort Bragg, North Carolina in the U.S. Army 311th Medical Station Hospital. They spent two years at Fort Bragg before returning to Jack's dental practice in Cliffside, where they began to raise a family and were very involved in their local community. Jack was often asked and good-naturedly agreed to help with community events, including being a flower girl in a womanless wedding to raise money for the Cliffside School. Military service called again during the Korean War, and they returned for two more years to the U.S. Army at Fort Bragg, where Jack finished his service as an Army Major. He continued to practice dentistry in Cliffside, but he, Ruby, and their family of five daughters settled back in Lattimore in the 1950s. They began to get involved in business, eventually creating the Roundup Stores Incorporated, which included several salvage business locations 
a convenience store, the campus covered, and two retail stores in Boiling Springs, North Carolina, the Campus Den and Sally's Department Store. In the early 70s, Jack decided to run for the North Carolina House of Representatives and subsequently served in the North Carolina legislature for 22 years. He served in leadership positions, including Chairman of Military and Veterans Affairs, the Committee on Appropriations, and many, many other committees over the years. He served an unprecedented four terms as Chairman of Rules and Operations of the House and was elected four times as Speaker Pro Tempore of the House. Jack's many and varied legislative accomplishments were highlighted by the fact that he was never a single-issue politician. His stances were not self-serving, nor was he tied to special interests lobbyists. His legislative issues were numerous and supported the greater good of the citizens of the state of North Carolina. These included the establishment of the South Mountains State Park, the Farmland Use Bill with Bob Falls, the Teaching Fellows Program with Billy Watkins and Liston Ramsey, the Sales Tax Redistribution Bill, which returned more tax revenues to rural counties, including Cleveland, Rutherford, and Polk counties, support for a bill which required power companies to pay for hydroelectric power at the same rate as steam-generated electricity, which resulted in a significant increase to the town of Lake Lure's income, 600,000 instead of 60,000. A community college satellite for Polk County. The Isothermal Community College radio station, WNCW, at the urging of Dr. Ben Fountain, president. The Cleveland Community College Student Activity Center. Appropriation support for North Shelby High School with Edith Lutz the first dialysis center for Shelby, the three strikes and you're in legislation, the OSHA program for North Carolina's workplace safety. Representative Hunt has been involved in many efforts over the years relating to health sciences and health education, including the following. Being an initial member of the Medical Manpower Study Commission, and he became a strong supporter in the North Carolina legislature for the establishment of the East Carolina Medical School when it was not a popular stance among his medical community friends nor the UNC University system. He served on the initial study commission to create the North Carolina Biotechnology Center and is the first and only board member emeritus of the North Carolina Biotechnology Center Board of Directors. He initiated the Nurse Education Act in the mid-1980s to enhance the stature of the nursing profession and to encourage more bright students, both men and women, to go into nursing. At that time, the nursing shortage was more acute than the teacher shortage. There were 85,000 nurses then, but half of them were not practicing. He patterned the bill after the Teaching Fellows Program. One of his greatest accomplishments is that he is a confidant and advisor to many people, governors, legislators, friends, neighbors, family, or someone he meets standing in the line of the grocery store. He enjoys people. And as one fellow legislator said, it should be noted that he is a populist, progressive, and willing to take a position. In Raleigh and at home, Jack and Ruby have always been known for bringing people together to get to know each other and to enjoy fellowship. Because, as D.G. Martin wrote in a column, no one can be mad at anyone when Ruby's cooking. Jack and Ruby have spent a lifetime with family, friends, and community service, serving on a variety of boards and organizations, including Shriners, Lattimore Church, First Baptist Church, Gardner-Webb University, Crawley Hospital, County Health Department, and many more. Many honors have come their way over the years. In 1982, the USS North Carolina Battleship Award for Outstanding Service to Veterans. In 1986, the Legislative Leaders Advanced Management Recognition. In 1991, the Legislator of the Year by Law Enforcement Officers. In 1993, the Parents as Teachers Award. In 2004, North Carolina's highest civilian honor, the Order of the Longleaf Pine. 
And in 2012, Gardner Webb University conferred the Honorary Doctor of Humanities degree. They continue to support the community in many ways, including the Earl Scrugg Center, the Shelby City Parks Tennis Facility, the Ruby C. Hunt YMCA, and now the Hunt School of Nursing and the Hunt Sisters Scholarship. Jack and Ruby enjoy life on their beautiful farm in every season in Lattimore, surrounded by their Cementhal Angus cows, jonquils, dogwoods, knockout roses, rolling fields, and a big beautiful vegetable garden. And they enjoy being surrounded by their growing family, the five daughters, five sons-in-law, 11 grandchildren, and six great-grandchildren. Firm believers in being involved with their family, friends, and their community, they live by the thought that in all things, the world would be a better place if the power of love replaced the love of power. Well, I thought I was right ready, but I think I am now. <clears throat> um, first, I'd like to say thank you to the radio and TV folks and Carolyn Young for setting up the video. Dad believed that Western North Carolina should have a radio station, and more than once when I would say, I teach at Isothermal Community College in Spindale, someone would always say, oh, I love WNCW. So thank you, WNCW, for putting Isothermal and Spindale on the map. Well, you'd think after 42 years of teaching that I wouldn't be nervous, but I am, so bear with me. <clears throat> I loved my time here at Isothermal. I taught 37 years full-time, five adjunct. I think I might have gone through about six presidents, Eason, Fountain, Lewis, Johnson, Dalton, and now Dr. Anuata. I love the community college system with its open-door policy and how much it benefits so many. And I'm so grateful for my many wonderful years here. Now, a little bit more about Dad. Dad was a steward of the land. In addition to Dad's support of WNCW, he was a strong supporter in the establishment of South Mountain State Park. When I was 16, we would often leave school early and go to the South Mountain Waterfall. That was before it was a park and it was very rustic and challenging. When Dad mentioned making it to a state park, I said, oh no, that'll just ruin it. They'll put steps, and it will ruin the rustic beauty. Fast forward 20 or 30 years later, when I was teaching water aerobics here at Isothermal to 60, 70, 80, and 90-year-olds, including Dr. Harry and Betty Hendrick, Virginia Taylor, Rosa Huffstetler, they said they wanted to go see that waterfall, and so we did and they all made it to the waterfall thanks to those steps. <laughs> so dad's long-term wisdom provided the opportunity for more to enjoy the beauty of our area and I often took my biology classes on field trips to South Mountain. My senior year in high school, I told dad I wanted to spend some more wilderness area. So dad set up a hike through Linville Gorge, the most wilderness areas east of Mississippi. Ed Fortenberry was an experienced gorge hiker and said to have frying pans under several rocks. Well, Dad, who was 50 and never hiked, decided he wanted to go. And he wanted proof. So we hauled a large video camera, 1972, 12 miles through the rugged gorge. Such a memorable trip, and we have video proof. And Dad may have been in bed for about two days after that. <laughs> he loved the outdoors and the land. He and his dad bought a farm in Lattimore. It was full of gullies and trash. It was just in terrible condition. But over the years, he groomed it to green, roll pa re green rolling pastures with Angus cows. He loved driving through the fields in his old car with straw hanging out of the door. On the farm, as the video said, he and Mom planted jonquils, knockout roses, and dogwoods. Well, Dad was a curious person, and he wanted to see if he could grow some dogwoods from seed. 
So he did some research, and with the help of Abel, they planted the dogwood seeds, and when they matured, he gave them in groupings of five, representing his five daughters, to people throughout the town. And if you drive through our quaint town of Lattimore today, you'll see some of these dogwood trees and also around the Lattimore Church Cemetery. Mom grew up on a farm hoeing cotton, and she wanted a large garden. Two of her specialties were Crowder peas and Silver Queen corn, which they would freeze. Corn freezing day was a tradition around the 4th of July. Dad liked to see how fast we could get the corn from the stalk to the freezer. So at 6 a.m. the corn was pulled, we shucked and silked it under the big oak tree outside, sent it inside to be washed, boiled, cooled, cut off, and bagged, sent to the freezer for many to enjoy later. Then we had to count the cobs, and often there was around 700. That tradition continues today, but on a much smaller scale. He was a steward of the land. He enjoyed and appreciated the beauty of our earth, and he left it better than he found it. He also had a servant's heart. Dad had a passion for help. As mentioned in the video, he initiated the Nurse Education Act in the 80s when there was a nursing shortage. It was modeled after the teaching fellows. Then came Gardner Webb Hunt School of Nursing and the Ruby Y. This passion he had for health care provided opportunities for nurses and helped in improving health. Dad practiced dentistry in Cliffside for 40 years, and if getting your teeth worked on one scary enough, some of you may remember the dark stairway with the creaky steps that led up to his office above the drugstore. Where one day while I was teaching water aerobics, one of the ladies in class gave me a great big smile and said, your dad put these teeth in. <laughs> he loved the people in the mill village of Cliffside and he enjoyed going to the Cliffside days and reminiscing for many years. While in Cliffside, he got to know Tubby Hawkins. Tubby had a store, the Hoggly Woggly, and he and Dad ended up buying some wet tennis shoes from a flood. That's when Dad got the salvage bug. They would go to train wrecks, floods, fires, all nights of the hour, and he loved the challenge of bidding on the salvage. This led to the Roundup store on 74 in Mooresboro. My sisters and I worked there cleaning cans, sorting nails, and folding clothes. This was in the 60s, and Wranglers were real popular. Seriously, I hope that's not my phone, because it sounds just like it. <laughs> Wranglers were real popular, and they were piled to the ceiling in the basement on sheets of plywood on sawhorses, no order, no sizing. It truly was a bargain basement. And Kathy Webb's uncle, Bo Green, he ran the show. But Mom added a touch of class by convincing Dad to buy Bobby Brooks. She did have five daughters. Years later, when the roundup burned, Dad didn't dwell on the loss. He talked about the service of the heroic firemen. He had an appreciation for the service of nurses, firemen, police, and others, a servant's heart. Well, I can't end without talking about cooking. While in Raleigh, Dad often called Mama spur of the moment and say, I'm going to invite a few over for supper. And this often turned into 30. But Mom always handled it with grace. They would have silver cream corn, crowder peas and cornbread, country ham, biscuits from scratch, and gravy. And there may have been some cornbread crumbled in milk. After their meals, they often seemed to bring folks together. And D.G. Martin wrote the article, No One's Angry When Ruby's Cooking. Well, after retirement, you'd always find them in the kitchen cooking for others. They might be making cowboy soup, which was our version of vegetable soup. They'd put it in glass jars and send it to neighbors. Or making a pimento tree. This was a three-tiered dish with homemade pimento cheese triangles sent for funerals and sickness. Or making biscuits from scratch. Dad was a math head, and he liked to say that each biscuit cost two cents, and he didn't understand why everyone didn't make biscuits from scratch. And they'd freeze these for later. Now that he was retired, Dad started looking for something to do. He told Mom he had a board meeting on Thursday night. And this became every Thursday night, a cardboard meeting. 
specifically Texas Hold'em, that he learned to play in his 80s, and he played with 40, 50, 6-year-olds to age 95, and often won. He decided to cook when he hosted the board meeting, often having hot dogs, homemade chili, slaw, sometimes pintos and cornbread, and often a large banana pudding. Well, Dad liked to show you how fast you can make a banana pudding. And he made it. Great big pan, laid everything out, the vanilla wafers, the bananas, the vanilla pudding, the Cool Whip, and he'd see how fast he could get those vanilla wafers in there, slice that banana in there, pour that pudding over, and cover it with Cool Whip. And he just didn't understand why people thought cooking was difficult. Well, this led to Dad cooking lunch on Tuesdays, not to interfere with Thursday cards, into his 80s and 90s. There'd be peas and corn, cornbread or biscuits, maybe a squash casserole, or maybe just soup. He might have local judges, or the guys from Mike Howell's tire store, or a neighbor lady. Always a bigger table, always inclusive. This became Tuesdays with Jack. He also wrote some stories from Lattimore, and some stories from Raleigh not to be published. <clears throat> Dad was fun. He bought an old fire truck for the farm for the grandkids to climb on, and maybe some of you attended a cabin party and experienced the train ride on the abandoned Southern Railroad, which he pur purchased a section of. You might catch him at a party singing Shantytown. He knew all the words, and he had the moves. Often at night, you'd find him and mom playing footsies on the couch while eating Briar's coffee ice cream. This nightly ice cream may have led to daddy's diabetes type 2. He lost a big toe to diabetes. And if you were with, visiting with him, he might flash that ear-to-ear -ear grin and say, you want to see my no-toe? <laughs> he was a mentor to many, taught us many lessons. One of his legacies might have been bringing people together, but one of his last lessons was teaching us how to age gracefully. Just this week on Sunday, I received this message from a childhood friend. It's amazing how your family seemed to adopt anybody and everybody they met. We had awesome parents, and indeed we did. Thank you, Kathy and staff. It's been a lovely evening. Did you know that at one time, the first lady of the great state of North Carolina had Rutherford County roots? Tonight, Mrs. Merle Umstead Ritchie joins us. She is the daughter of the former North Carolina governor, William B. Umstead. Her mother, Mrs. Merle Davis Umstead, a native of the Sunshine Community. Mrs. Ritchie remembers childhood summers, happily spent in sunshine. She stayed with her grandmother, Mrs. Daisy Washburn Davis. Mrs. Ritchie says they played in Gleason Tony School Bus. She said she enjoyed front yard games with other children, usually at least a dozen. And she says sunshine was a very close community of friends, the ladies enjoyed gathering under the umbrella tree. They would uh, shell the butter beans. Later, Mrs. Ritchie became interested in a lot of the old deeds at our Rutherford County Courthouse. She proudly inherited land from her grandparents to which she has added. Her grandmother and parents taught her the importance of taking care of the land and the people who live on it, respectfully and responsibly. Her family often comes to the grandmother's house still to be a part of the continued management. Mrs. Ritchie is an attorney in Durham 
and she has made the trip here tonight from Durham to be with us. She is married to Russell Ritchie, Dean Emeritus at the Candler School of Theology at Emory University. They have two children, William and Elizabeth. Let's welcome Mrs. Merle Umstead Ritchie. So I am here to talk about my mother, not about myself. So I'll start with that. My mother, Merle Davis Umstead, was born in Bostick in 1901 on the old Sunshine Road. Her childhood was spent in Sunshine, where her parents, Daisy Washburn Davis, Daisy Washburn and Charlie Davis, ran a general merchandise store, sometimes called the Sunshine Cash Store, and sometimes called E.N. Washburn Store Number 2. My grandmother was Nolly Washburn's sister. My mother recalled playing in the coffins upstairs in the store. She recalled her father walking to the store at all hours for community emergencies because the only telephone was in the store. This store closed about 1936 when my grandfather died. My mother repeated the seventh grade more than once until she was old enough to go away to school. She then attended the Asheville Normal School, Normal and Collegiate Institute, where she won a contest. The prize was a year of college. She was given the choice of Temple University in Pennsylvania or Trinity College in Durham. She chose Trinity. After her first year of college, she worked in Raleigh for the Internal Revenue Service to earn the cost of completing college. She graduated from Duke University in 1926 with the first class to receive degrees from the newly named Duke University, formerly known as Trinity College. Following graduation, she served as principal for the Sunshine School. She recalled beginning the day by stoking the school furnace. As principal at Sunshine, she had three teachers. She then taught math and Latin at Central High School in Rutherfordton, where she also had a Girl Scout troop. She rented a room in a large house on Main Street in Rutherfordton, across from St. John's. One of her jobs during her university years was in a Durham bookstore, owned by a man who had sev several children. He asked her to babysit for his family. One of his cousins was William Umstead, my father, who visited his house and there met my mother. They were married in September 1929. At that time, my father had already begun his political career in 1926 being elected solicitor or prosecuting attorney for North Carolina's 10th Judicial District, which included Durham County and four other counties. In 1932, my father was elected to represent North Carolina's sixth district in the United States, of Ho United States House of Representatives, serving three terms, six years, under Franklin Roosevelt. My parents then spent much time in Washington, D.C., where they usually lived at the Willard Hotel. The Willard is still there. My mother recalled having breakfast at the White House when Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt prepared scrambled eggs at the table. My mother developed a knowledge of Washington history and sites. She gave tours of Washington to constituents who visited from North Carolina. She kept a scrapbook of the events she attended, including the particular invitation and the newspaper coverage of the event. After my mother's death, I gave this scrapbook, along with over 
40,000 items related to my parents' lives, including store records of the Sunshine Cash Store, to the Southern Historical Collection at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. After the three terms in the House of Representatives, my father did not run for this seat again, and my parents returned to full-time life in Durham and my father to his law practice. I was born in 1942. During her Durham life, my mother enjoyed playing bridge. She played with the same eight ladies for 50 years. My mother said that she could never have been a joiner of clubs because she did not have a four orchid bosom. In 1946, my father was appointed to the United States Senate, filling the position vacated on the death of North Carolina Senator Josiah Bailey, and my parents resumed their Washington commute. I'm wearing the necklace my mother wore when my father was sworn in as senator. In 1952, my father was elected governor of North Carolina and inaugurated in January of 1953. I now quote from the book North Carolina's First Ladies, which was on display tonight. Quote, just two days into his term, he suffered a heart attack. As a result, the First Lady played an even more important role than usual in his administration, including being largely responsible for managing the governor's schedule. Governor Umstead had held most of his appointments in the mansion, often around a table in his bedroom. Since his schedule was limited by his heart condition, Mrs. Umstead determined which invitations to accept and which to decline and which events were important enough to work into the governor's limited schedule. Despite the unusual circumstances, Merle Davis Umstead managed the mansion beautifully, without problems or complaints, even though she did not have an office staff, social secretary, or appointments manager." Unquote. In my opinion, in order to do this, she had to have an intimate and complete knowledge of how the government worked, who were the important players in my father's administration, what his goals were, and how he wanted to go forward. Mr. Ed Rankin, my father's executive secretary, told me that my parents were always on the same page. As an aside, I would add that in all my life, I never heard an angry word pass between them and was never aware of any disagreement. My father died in office, that mean, I mean while he was governor, on November the 7th, 1954 at age 59. My mother and I were immediately homeless because after my father died, we had no right to live in the mansion. We returned to Durham. The legislature gave my mother a car. I changed schools in the seventh grade. This was a very difficult time for my mother. My parents had intended to build a home in Durham for their life after the mansion. House plans were ready, and the house lot had been purchased, but nothing had been built. Also, my grandmother Davis suffered with lung cancer. Also, my father had an elderly half-brother whom he looked after, and he expressed the hope my mother would continue this pattern, which she did for his lifetime, moving him from rooming house to rooming house and renting out his home where he could no longer live alone. Four years after my father died, my mother purchased a home. My husband and I now live in the house she bought in 1958. My mother was involved in several activities related to my father's life and death. In gathering photographs and examining calendars, she helped prepare the book of letters and papers, as was customarily done when a governor left office, usually done with the, atten with the attention from the former governor. 
She also participated in ceremonies honoring my father in connection with naming for him the William B. Umstead State Park, which borders the Raleigh-Durham Airport, named for him because of his conservation efforts. And the William B. Umstead Bridge on the coast, rep replacing the old ferry system linking Manteo to Hatteras Island and Nags Head Beach. At that time, this bridge was an engineering marvel being curved in the middle and very high so boats could pass under without a drawbridge. While completed after his death, it was a fulfillment of a promise he made in his campaign for governor. Also, a dormitory at East Carolina University is named for him. After I left home for college, my mother rented rooms in her home to students, mostly from Durham Technical Community College. My grandmother, Daisy Washburn Davis, died in 1961, leaving my mother the ownership and management of Rutherford County property. Like many in Rutherford County, my mother began to convert farm la farmed land to pine woodlands and fa as farming began to decline in the county. She learned about forestry and continued forest management until her death. My mother died in 1988 at age 86. She is buried at Mount Tabor Methodist Church alongside of my father in rural northern Durham County. Her marker states that she was born in Rutherford County, North Carolina. That's all. Well, it has certainly been a very entertaining, informative, enlightening evening. And Kathy, I need to ask you, first of all, would you like to do door prizes now? Uh, I think we'll just, since so, so we have, no. <laughs> okay. Then. Okay, so the winners will be notified. Sounds good. Thank you for attending tonight. Closing, I would like to introduce to you the current president of Isil Thermo Community College, Dr. Margaret Anunciata. Thank you all so much for sharing your evening with us. I hope that each of you enjoyed the time here this evening as much as I did. Um, as someone who's only been in the community for about 19 months, this was powerful to me to understand more about the community that I am so very proud to call home now. And, you know, at Isothermal Community College, our mission, as you heard earlier, is to improve life through learning. That's the kind of the tag, the simple version. And we can talk about that in lots of different ways. And I take great pride in working with the amazing people here at the college to improve life through learning. Thankful for um, Jay, who's come back to share that with us this evening. I'm thankful. Um, for the opportunity to um, have heard from Cindy uh, Martin to share that with us again this evening. But as I was thinking about improving life through learning, I thought, wow, Isothermal Community College this evening improved my life through learning. And I am grateful for that. I hope you had the same experience. I hope you'll come back for more of the series. I'd like to, again, express my gratitude to the staff and to the planning team who made this pro uh, possible this evening. So please give them one more round of applause. <laughs> and to all of the speakers who shared their time with us, I am beyond grateful 
and uh, really just want to thank you for being a part of this community college. We are your community's college, and it was great to share this time with our community together. So thank you so very much for being here. We look forward to seeing you at the next event um, on October 6th. Hope you'll join us then. Thank you so much.